Okay, so um, Dirk Dean, head of our Neuropath section, will introduce our uh, grand round speaker today. Dirk. Thank you, Larry. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Semino, who has been with us for quite some time, except with a little interruption here and there. So um, PJ uh, got his undergraduate degree at UW, uh, graduating magna cum laude. Uh, he stayed here in the MSTP uh, uh, training program and um, uh, did some amazing things. He did his PhD with Tom Montine in pathology and, um, and then went off to St. Louis where he uh, did his AP uh, residency, his NP fellowship. He also participated in uh, some additional uh, research training out there uh, with Dr. Gutman. Uh, and then we were lucky enough to recruit him back to Seattle, which has been uh, really tremendous. Uh, PJ started here as an acting assistant professor. He's now assistant professor, also an affiliate investigator. No, you're a, yeah, you're affiliate investigator. Now visiting scientist and now affiliate investigator at the Hutch, uh, focusing on um, uh, uh, glioma biology, as you'll see from his talk. Uh, PJ has, uh, has done really well. He's had a number of different small grants um, as, a, as an early faculty member and is also the recipient of a K08. And so uh, he's well on his way. He has published, I, I can't, I, I've lost track, but it's over 50 PubMed index manuscripts uh, that he's co-authored since he's been here. Uh, very prolific and uh, really has a bright, a bright future. Uh, he's going to talk to us about incorporating molecular criteria into grading of diffuse gliomas. So uh, with that, Dr. Semino. Thank you, Dirk, uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm privileged and happy to be sharing uh, this talk today, talking about incorporating molecular findings into the grading of diffuse gliomas. Uh, it's going to be a little translational and clinical heavy uh, with some of the research that we've been doing in the Seattle area uh, based upon these. So just for kind of an outline of the talk, you guys, okay, uh, just going to talk a little bit about the historical context of diffuse glioma classification and grading uh, systems so everybody can have kind of the basic um, background. Then talk about the 2016 World Health, World Health Organization classification system for brain tumors. And this was really the first time in uh, solid tumor biology where uh, the WHO had incorporated histology grading with uh, molecular features in order to produce integrated diagnoses and di uh, diagnostic classifications. Then since 2016, um, recognizing the, um, the issues that come along with uh, uh, histo histological grading in a newly revised classification system, there's been some uh, advances in uh, applying molecular grading criteria to lower grade diffuse gliomas, especially uh, diffuse astrocytic gliomas. And then uh, moving beyond what's being incorporated now, uh, looking at uh, uh, incorporating prognostic copy number alterations in glioblastoma, going beyond a grading system in uh, we believe this has some implications for clinical trials and risk stratification. So just um, uh, a little bit of terminology defined up front for people who don't know much about copy number alterations. It's just basically uh, gains or losses of parts of the DNA, either whole chromosome or parts of a chromosome or genes um, in certain regions that, uh, that are more than normal or less than normal and are not germline mutations, but they happen in uh, the somatic DNA in the tumor biology. So just a brief background on diffuse glioma classification and grading in a historical context. So um, brain tumor classification really was uh, formalized in the 1920s with Bailey and Cushing. And kind of up here in the, the left-hand corner, I show this algorithm they used um, it's really to define tumors by their uh, presumed um, cell of origin, or at least the cells they look like. This included things like ependymomas, uh, gliomas, et cetera. <clears throat> and throughout the years, about the last hundred years or so, uh, there's been different uh, classification and grading systems uh, based upon solely upon histology. 
and the, the current, current um, system that we use is the World Health Organization, the WHO, which when I was a resident and fellow, we were working in the 2007 uh, edition, which still had a classification based upon uh, histology. So traditionally, um, either for new trainees or people that have been doing this a while, uh, classification of diffuse gliomas has been referred to either as um, oligodendroglial, that's the tumor cells that look more like normal oligodendroglial cells. They're round, regular, and they have this artifact of preservation called perinuclear clearing. Some people call it a fried egg appearance. Astrocytic tumors are a little more um, uh, pleomorphic. You have increased nuclear size. Uh, they're hyperchromatic, and for the non-pathologist, it means they're more blue on staining and some nuclear irregularities. And then something that uh, used to be a, a issue or a classification was when tumors had mixed uh, morphologies in um, uh, both oligodendroglial and astrocytic morphologies. And this led to um, some actual poor inner observer of reliability and variability in diagnoses and some heated discussions at um, QA conferences and uh, tumor review conferences. But this is uh, generally how tumors have been classified. And then upon after that, you want to uh, come up with a risk stratification system. So we uh, grade these diffuse gliomas. Um, again, not updated with the 2016 system, but traditionally, um, either looking at oligodendroglial tumors or astrocytic tumors, um, grade two is um, less aggressive than grade four. So the split between grade two and grade three is traditionally uh, increased mitotic activity, which for all gadendroglial tumors have been um, somewhat well-defined at six mitoses per 10 high power field. Astrocytic tumors uh, have been called like a diffuse astrocytoma versus anaplastic astrocytoma is defined upon uh, increased mitotic activity, which is really a gray area. And something I'm gonna talk about uh, the work that we've done at UW to try to address this. And then for traditional grade four astrocytic tumors, which have been uh, called glioblastomas, we get the uh, additional presence of necrosis and or microvascular proliferation. And you can see here, as the grade go up, survival time goes down and you get increased mitotic activity and necrosis of microvascular proliferation. So that's kind of the general of how tumors were thought of for risk stratification. In 2008, uh, targeted sequencing panel applied to a, a group of glioblastomas, identified mutations in the isocitrate dehydrogenase genes one and two, which is a Krebs cycle protein that occur about in five to 10 or 15%, depending on your study of uh, grade four glioblastomas, where uh, you can see here on the Kaplan-Meier curve that uh, there's an increased um, survival benefit for those that have IDH mutation compared to IDH wild type. The next year, the same group went on to um, uh, sequence um, the lower grade uh, uh, gliomas, the uh, uh, grade two and grade three gliomas. And uh, unlike the, the grade fours, most of these are IDH mutated, about 80%, depending on the study you look at. And they also have a survival. So um, those familiar with um, tumors realized that uh, IDH mutated in different types of tumors, including cholangiocarcinoma, uh, uh, AML, and it's kind of backwards in those type of tumors, IDH mutation is worse. In, uh, in brain tumors, gliomas, having IDH mutation has an actual survival benefit and it's better for the patient in general. So where we kind of sit now, 2016, we incorporate histology and molecular features into classification with the um, updated system. So we basically took the histology looking at astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas or oligoastrocytomas, which now we know either split into uh, astrocytomas or oligodendrogliomas, depending on their uh, molecular profiling. So, well, we have IDH mutant tumors in lower grades, and if they have 1p19q co-deletion, they uh, go in down this um, oligodendroglioma route. If they don't, they usually have p53 mutations or ATR loss uh, or biomunohistochemistry or mutations, and this indicates a diffuse astrocytoma in IDH mutant. On histology, uh, glioblastomas have, are currently classified based upon 
mutational status, either IDH mutant or IDH prototype, uh, which will not be the case going forward. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But this is kind of where we're at now if you're practicing um, where we've been at for about five years. Okay, so I mentioned that um, classification have changed with the 2016, but the grading did not. And so um, this has been particularly a problem in grade two and grade three astrocytomas. When you correct for IDH status, um, most studies, but not all studies, um, show that uh, there's really no difference in survival uh, between these uh, grade two versus grade three astrocytomas. Just kind of highlight this with uh, one of the studies, uh, early studies looking at this, looking at IDH mutant cases on the left and IDH one type cases on the right. You can see that they have overlapping survival curves um, and no statistically significant difference. So it seems that grading had been generally uh, reflective of IDH status rather than actual mitotic counts or um, histological features. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, what is the minority type of the grade two, grade three uh, diffuse gliomas, uh, which is IDH wild type diffuse astrocytic glioma grading system. And one of the first things that people started to look at is going beyond histology, looking at uh, molecular profiles of histologically lower grade uh, astrocytic tumors that are IDH wild type, which may confer a um, more aggressive behavior. And uh, just to orient everybody on this as well, uh, what a lot of the, um, the early studies did was look at um, genetic markers or um, genomic markers uh, that are very common in glioblastoma and apply those to lower grade histology tumors. So one of the um, alterations that we look at, the copy number alteration, uh, you can see on this frequency um, copy number plot, uh, I'll just orient you. So on the y-axis, it's either percent gain within a tumor or percent loss within a tumor. And this is using the TCGA data set and the chromosome numbers uh, across the uh, x-axis here. And most uh, glioblastomas will have uh, both co-gain of whole chromosome seven along with loss of chromosome 10. And through uh, some work, uh, we know that these are early events in uh, gliomogenesis for IDH wild type tumors, the gain of seven and the loss of 10. So these are prevalent throughout. And when you apply this criteria over here uh, across multiple studies, but I'm just showing uh, one here, showing the survival curves. If you, if you break up gain of seven or 10 in any way, you get a survival curve that looks like traditionally more uh, histologically defined glioblastoma here, whether, rather than having no loss of, or no gain of seven, loss of 10. So it seems to be that um, the signature of glioblastoma, if seen in a lower grade glioma, also has a, a poor prognostic phenotype. Uh, another alteration that's uh, seen in glioblastoma is its EGFR amplification. This occurs in about 50% of IDH wild type glioblastomas. And uh, the modality which we usually test for here is fluorescence and situ hybridization here you have the um, centromere in green and the, the red EGFR signal in, excuse me, in red. And EGFR uh, is usually found in extra chromosomal double minutes, um, which allows it to be amplified at quite a high level. And if you look at a co coverage number, uh, coverage plot, such as in a targeted cancer assay uh, from uh, work that we published in others, you can see that EGFR is uh, very highly amplified in these tumors. And similar with chromosome seven um, gain and chromosome 10 loss. If you look at lower grade histologically defined gliomas and look at EGFR amplification, those with EGFR amplification have a much shorter survival time than those without EGFR amplification. And one of the, um, the final uh, more prevalent mutations is not actually a copy number alteration. So uh, it doesn't quite fit in the, in the, the theme, but um, it's still, uh, it's a single nucleotide <clears throat> at one of two positions within the uh, promoter of the TERC gene, which is the telomerase gene. And these cause over um, expression or increased transcription of the telomerase. So we know that um, cancer in general has to either have like telomerase or TERC promoter mutations or have uh, a phenotype that's alternative lengthening of the telomeres. And uh, when we apply this also to lower grade gliomas, to promoter uh, 
mutants have a much lower survival than those of their own, their counterparts that are terpromoter or wild type. So looking at all the evidence for uh, these copy number associated molecular alterations, um, these were uh, looked at by a, a consortium, the C Impact Now, which is the consortium to inform molecular and pathology um, taxonomy, not official WHO, but through the people, um, experts who sit on the WHO, including um, neuropathologists, neuro-oncologists, radiation oncologists, in order to um, kind of up update um, practices or recommendations for tumor classification and treatment. Um, in between WHO editions, which has typically been about uh, every 10 years, but um, they're gonna be shooting for every five years coming up. Uh, but in uh, was it, uh, a year or two ago, they had um, taken this, uh, the recommendations for these criteria and in introduced the first molecular grading of uh, gliomas. So just kind of this little algorithm here if it's histolo histologically a diffuse or anaplastic astrocytoma, grade two, grade three, doesn't meet our traditional uh, histological definitions of a glioblastoma. And it's IDH wild type and not midline or H3 histone mutant. Um, and it has any one or of these three alterations, e.g. for amplification, cogain of seven, and loss of tanner to promoter mutation. Um, they, they had, um, term these diagnostic entities, diffuse astrocytic glioma, IDH wild type with molecular features of glioblastoma, WHO grade four, which is quite a mouthful to say. But um, they wanted to, uh, at that time, make sure that, um, that it was really conveyed that histologically they look lower grade, but uh, molecularly they look high grade. And uh, there's been a couple of studies uh, since this recommendation has gone uh, through looking at the, um, the application of this uh, classification system or suggestions to um, institutional cohorts. And I just wanted to highlight on, um, uh, on the left here, I show a Venn diagram showing that they, they most, they do have some overlapping, but it's not always like you always have seven uh, gain of seven loss of 10 with EGFR amplification or to promoter mutation. So it's really quite a, a spectrum. But most uh, IDH wild type astrocytomas do meet the molecular glioblastoma criteria, especially here at the University of Washington, where we see a lot more um, adult or older adult patients. And when you look at uh, either histologically defined or molecularly defined uh, glioblastomas, they have overlapping survival curves as opposed to those without uh, any histological or um, molecular features of glioblastoma. And it's believed that this actually represents a heterogeneous population of tumors, which I'm going to uh, talk about, but will not be classified as such as IDH wild type astrocytomas anymore. So I just want to present a um, summary of classification and grading uh, changes over time for IDH wild type diffuse astrocytic gliomas. So you can kind of get an um, illustration of the, um, the um, evolution over time of this. So it used to be you had a diffuse astrocytoma, increased mitosis, it becomes anaplastic astrocytoma. And this is really the split where um, clinically it's low grade, high grade versus uh, getting chemotherapy or, radi or radiation. And then if you add microvascular proliferation on top of this or and or necrosis, you get to a glioblastoma. And this is what traditionally has been taught and what mo most people think about when they think about diffuse gliomas. In 2016, um, I'm gonna get rid of the IDH mutant uh, tumors for right now, just to talk about IDH wild type. So it's basically the same scheme, but it was called um, integrated diagnosis. So it'd be diffuse astrocytoma IDH wild type or anaplastic astrocytoma IDH wild type, glioblastoma IDH wild type. And with the C impact criteria, this gets a little more complicated. So now you can have anything that's histologically defined as a grade two or grade three. If it meets the molecular criteria, it was called diffuse astrocytic glioma with IDH wild type with molecular features of glioblastoma, WHO grade four. But in, in the upcoming WHO uh, that's um, being finalized, the, it's going through final editorial um, editing right now, um, there will no longer be a distinction between histologically defined and molecularly defined glioblastoma. 
there will only be glioblastoma IDH wild type. In thing, entities that used to be called either diffuse astrocytoma or anaplastic astrocytoma will no longer be uh, diagnostic entities. So we can't call anything an anaplastic astrocytoma anymore or diffuse astrocytoma. And it's thought that a lot of the IDH wild type tumors actually resolve into what is being considered as pediatric type diffuse gliomas. So um, the, I think the emphasis and the, the focus of why the WHO was going this way is because that um, a lot of time IDH wild type uh, diagnoses were based upon the absence of evidence. So it's not looking for drivers, it's the absence of drivers. And the really the focus is we need to be looking for what is driving the tumors, what is driving oncogenesis, what are the disease defining mutations. So um, we'll be, uh, this will require a, a little bit more work up here. Um, either looking at targeted gene panel sequencing like Oncoplex, um, or if uh, we can get it online uh, through the cytogenetics lab, looking at methylation profiling, uh, anything anything's like that. So you, uh, I think everybody in, the, uh, in this field, you'll be seeing new diagnostic entities, um, including diffuse astrocytoma, MIB, MIB-L1 altered, Angiocentric glioma was also have MIM, MIM1 alterations. The PLNTY, which uh, frequently have FGFR fusions or diffuse low grade gliomas with MAP kinase pathway alterations, which can be any number of things in the RAS, RAF um, MECR signaling pathway, even receptor tyrosine kinase alterations. And then high grade tumors, um, which we know diffuse like gliomas, which will be referred to as H3K27 altered. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it's not just seeing an H3K27M mutant any longer. Um, there's also the diffuse hemispheric gliomas that have different histone mutations. And um, uh, the infant type hemispheric gliomas, which we probably won't see, but uh, you should be aware of them. And these are really defined by the lack of um, uh, mutations and that are really driven by gene fusions, such as those in receptor tyrosine kinases or the um, neurotrophic kinase receptors. Okay. Now I wanted to move on from the IDH wild type tumors to talk about the IDH mutant uh, astrocytic glioma grading system. So as I mentioned before, um, it was that histologically defined astrocytic gliomas really had um, seem to be worse um, if they were considered a grade three, but uh, upon um, detection of IDH mutations and the majority of these tumors, most studies, not all, but most, consider that um, there is really no survival benefit between uh, for grading of these tumors. This is still, still something that's controversial, but uh, I, personally, I believe that a lot of the evidence shows that uh, grading is not well-defined. And um, locally, when um, we had a, uh, there's a lot of inter observer variability that goes along with this, especially when there's ill defined um, mitotic thresholds for these. So, no clear mitotic thresholds. Uh, there's no consensus guidelines available. There's no data to support what to use. And there's high inter observer variability. So, at least in our division, uh, when I started, it was, you know, you could have a mitotic um, index of, uh, that one person would call a grade two and another person would call a grade three. And, you know, not just within our institution, but uh, elsewhere as well. So we wanted to know if um, the, the lack of having defined criteria for uh, mitotic activity could explain the lack of um, clear cut uh, risk stratification for WHO grading. So working uh, with Dirk and Becky Yoda, who is our current um, research neuropathology fellow, along with some other uh, undergraduate researchers uh, started looking at an institutional cohort of these tumors. So I just went through and I, I, I looked for everything that was uh, considered a grade two, grade three diffuse glioma uh, that had been operated on at the university between 2000 and 2010. Uh, at the, this is a project I started when I first got here. So I wanted to um, have at least five year follow up. So we started this in 2015. Uh, unless they had recurrence of tumor or death first. And then went, went on to see what cases had existing tissue blocks. And then after that, uh, 
perform a whole uh, epoch ray infinium methylation profiling on these tumors in order to get classification as well as copy number alterations. And uh, Becky and others diligently went through and uh, did mitotic counts both at uh, per high power volumes as well as total mitoses in the uh, surgical sample. And we had three reviewers for this and we had uh, good inner observer variability. I forgot the co Cohen's Kappa coefficient, but it was good. And when we did uh, different analyses, I'm just showing an example here of looking at different um, Kaplan-Meier thresholds versus um, uh, receiver operator curves. We could really detect no difference in survival at any threshold for mitotic activity, which you think, oh, well, it's an absence. Would there be something that's more positive that we could say? How do we just know that we'd, we're not powered for this? So uh, we also, with the um, methylation profiling, looked at known um, cancer-causing uh, copy number alterations as well as some that we, uh, at, when I, I defined when I was uh, uh, first started with Eric, you know, Eric Holland working at his lab in the Hutch. And when we apply these, either CDK4 amplification or CDK2 homozygous deletion, we're gaining our chromosome 14Q loss. Um, on univariate analysis as well as multivariate analysis, uh, we, we showed that um, CDK and 2A homozygous deletion is a poor um, prognostic marker in overall, for overall survival of our uh, IDH mutant astrocytomas. Methylation, MGMT methylation was also a, a, a factor as well as chromosome 14 loss. So we do have at least a molecular marker not histological marker that indicated a higher grade of uh, IDH mutant astrocytomas. Indeed, um, several studies around the same time have looked at similar cohorts and um, show that there's a poor prognostic marker associated with um, um, loss of CDK and 2A. Here, the older name is ink 4 arf and in IDH mutant astrocytomas, nearly 100% have T53 mutations. So this arm of the um, cell cycle um, pathway is uh, generally mutated. And then uh, either having CDK and 2A uh, homozygous deletion or CDK4 amplification or RB1 mutations basically shuts down this arm as well. So you get uh, increased cell cycle uh, uh, interactions. And this was, um, at least for this marker, was shown um, out of Germany, across the US and Japan, and um, there's really a lot of strong evidence for this. Uh, I know it's Grand Rounds rather than Path Presents, but I'm gonna show one mouse slide. Uh, it's showing that it, in an uh, IDH mutant uh, astrocytoma model coming out of uh, the Holland lab at the Hutch, that there's also similar survival differences uh, between those um, mouse tumors having either homozygous loss or heterozygous loss of CDK and 2A. So just a, a summary of the um, prognostic copy number that um, we and others have shown uh, CDK into a homozygous deletion, either CDK4 amplification or chromosome 14 loss, or a total somatic copy number alteration load, which uh, is uh, coming out of Rochester as well as uh, Heidelberg, um, has been kind of a, a strong marker for uh, uh, poor survival in IDH mutant astrocytomas. But the CDK and 2A homozygous deletion had the most evidence for it. When the CMPAC got together, um, I had mentioned that they had update three talking about IDH wild type um, astrocytomas. Then the, the update five, they had recommendations for incorporating uh, this as a, a marker for uh, grade four in IDH mutant astrocytomas. So we and others have begin, begun to incorporate that into our uh, stratification and diagnostic strategies for um, IDH mutant astrocytomas. And I just wanted to um, go over a similar uh, evolution of diagnosis of IDH mutant astrocytically almost over time um, because some of the nomenclature is going to be a, a bit unusual for these tumors. So again, we start with the traditional diffuse astrocytoma going to anaplastic astrocytoma, going to glioblastoma. And despite our best efforts, uh, oh, no. and uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to that in a second. So um, then this was, um, again, refined to diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant, you know, plastic astrocytoma IDH mutant, or glioblastoma IDH mutant. And then with the C-impact now, 
even though it's debated, most um, studies don't show that there's a survival difference. And our paper had come out by this time showing that there's no good mitotic threshold. The, the CMPAC now decided to keep this kind of vague um, threshold of significant mitotic activity here. So we're not getting rid of this anytime soon. So um, we have grade two to grade three to grade four, but now if you're at the, one of these lower grade tumors, and if you have a CDK and 2A homozygous deletion, um, you're gonna get to a, a WHO grade four. And just a little bit about the nomenclature as well. So this is no longer diffuse astrocytoma. This will no longer be anaplastic astrocytoma. This will no longer be glioblastoma IDH mutant. This is like other tumor types in the WHO where you assign it a, a classification system and then you grade it after that, like an MPNST or something like that. So it's an IDH mutant astrocytoma, grade two, grade three, grade four. And uh, these are upcoming. We've uh, some people in our group have um, uh, started to incorporate uh, this kind of terminology and diagnosis into the pathology reports. So I'm sure uh, most people in at least in our local community, are, are aware of these changes that are happening. And I just wanted, um, as an illustration of how molecular features might not necessarily overlap with what we think uh, traditionally of a high-grade glioma, I just wanted to present this patient that was a senior at the University of Washington. So this is a 31-year-old woman. She presented with three weeks of worsening headache. On her right, the MRI, she had a T2 flare hyperintense, but non contrast enhancing expansile mass. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, it also had um, an MRI feature, which we refer to as T2 flare mismatch, which indicates IDH mutant astrocytoma with a hyperintense rim. She underwent, uh, and then based upon the non enhancement, um, the, the radiology was felt to be suggestive of a lower maybe intermediate grade glioma, so grade two or grade three. Then she underwent surgical resection. h and &E stain slide showed a, a diffuse astrocytic glioma, mitotic count up to two mitoses per 10 high power field with no necrosis or microvascular proliferation. Again, on this kind of gray area where depending who reads it, it may be either grade two or grade three. The immune histochemistry showed that it was IDH mutant P53 was increased, ATRX was lost, and the uh, KI67 proliferative index was still somewhat low around 5%. Fluorescence in situ hybridization showed that 1P19Q was not codeleted. So historically in this, we'd see something that was histologically a grade two, a grade three, IDH mutant astrocytoma. But with the new um, molecular criteria, this was sent for on oncoplex um, Target net generation sequencing. It's a part of that panel that did show here. So if we go across um, here again, uh, relative copy number on the y axis and chromosomes on the uh, x axis, and CDK into a lives here on the uh, short arm of uh, chromosome nine. So there's homozygous deletion. So the final integrated diagnosis would be astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade four. I believe this is how the case was signed out. So again, someone who's young in a non-enhancing mass or non-enhancing mass by MRI. Traditionally, this would be thought of as a low grade tumor, but it has molecular features indicating it's going to be, behave like a, a grade four. I don't believe there's long enough term follow-up on this specific patient to know, um, know much, but I uh, just wanted to show that how it highlights that these molecular uh, alterations of, in copy number can really drive the new uh, grading criteria for IDH. So just a, a summary of kind of all diffuse gliomas and classification over time. Again, this is traditionally what we thought more of in the 2007 classification uh, and grading system where everything was defined by histology. We had astros, oligoastros, oligos, and then um, diffuse versus anaplastic. Integrating in the IDH mutational status of these, the list got longer of the new diagnostic entities that we could um, uh, put in our diagnostic line where the, um, the classification was a mixture of uh, histological features as well as um, molecular features, but the grading was by histology. And um, the WHO coming out um, cleans this up a little bit. Um, it doesn't clean up the workup, but it uh, 
kind of cleans up the, uh, the classification and diagnosis. Again, there will only, for adult type tumors only, is not getting into that uh, crazy pediatric type uh, diffuse gliomas, but it's basically astrocytoma IDH mutant, grade two, grade three, grade four. Oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant and 1P19Q codilated. Again, no anaplastic um, designation in any of the um, entities in the CNS tumor. And then glioblastoma IDH uh, wild type, grade four. So we're, we're getting there along with um, having um, uh, molecular features being incorporating into grading of these tumors and having a more simplified, kind of a more simplified um, reporting system. So uh, a lot of that talk was, I know, a little bit fast, but um, talked most about the grade two, grade three tumors and the issues with um, grading and having what we now know as um, mostly copy number alterations in uh, predicting poor uh, outcome of those patients. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, what happens when we look at somatic copy number alterations in glioblastoma, so grade four, so you're already at a high grade, but what does that mean within the glioblastoma diagnostic entity itself, and what does it mean for the patient? So just a, a background of these slides, um, uh, for those who are not uh, as familiar with glioblastoma, on the left, it just I just want to show it has a terrible survival overall compared to most cancers. Um, it's got a low prevalence, but it's also got one of the lowest five-year survival um, with this, which is just under 7%. And the, um, the standard therapy um, is kind of this um, nonspecific uh, radiation and chemotherapy, uh, alkylating agent temozolomide, that it's really the best um, therapeutic advance we've had over the last 100 years or so which has a survival benefit of only about 10 weeks. We've added some things on uh, to this, including tumor treating fields and everything, but um, it, there's really uh, a need for improved therapy. And so, and there's been a ton of clinical trials uh, looking for more specific um, targeted therapies for these patients, but most, if not, you know, most of these fail. And, um, just kind of think about why do these why do these fail, um, or why why they might not be think, thought about in the correct way. So there are clinical factors that are um, different uh, across different tumor types, including uh, age. We know um, younger people do better. Uh, performance status: people who perform better and are able to take care of the daily activities do better than those who can't. Uh, things like that. There's also um, survival um, based upon where tumors are located, uh, brain stem region or flammic region, or um, even parts of the um, cortex. And depending on where it is, you can have different amounts of extent for resection. And uh, not only is clinical factors and anatomical factors, there's a ton of molecular information that differs between uh, patients, including chromosomal copy number alterations, uh, gene alterations, so uh, single nucleotide variations or indels, uh, the neoplastic component of the tumor, and then the, also the TME, um, which is a tumor microenvironment, so the uh, immune cells and uh, other supporting cells in the environment. We know that um, epigenetic changes, either whole, whole genome-wide epigenetic changes or specific genes um, can play a part in this, as well as transcriptional changes, so at the RNA level. Um, it's just very, very complex. And um, I, I believe that based upon the, the fact that um, copy number alterations have at least been shown to be prognostic in lower grade tumors, we'd gone on to look at um, their implication in the glioblastomas as well. So this gets a, a little um, graph heavy here, but um, when we first started working with Eric uh, Holland, uh, we were looking at the, the genetic, her genetic heterogeneity, again, using the TCGA data as a, uh, as a uh, model. So here we're looking at what is multidimensional scaling, which is the dimensionality reduction, um, kind of similar to either uh, principal component analysis or TSNE plots or UMAP plots, where tumor and um, each point on this plot is a single patient's tumor, which is 
uh, a reduction of a whole um, matrix of copy number alterations and single nucleotide variations. And the more genetically similar tumors are together, the more they cluster, the less genetically similar they are there. Push farther apart in this map. And when you map on um, what's traditionally the, the histological grading scheme for these, um, it is more that the grade fours tend to live over in this region of the map. And the, there's really no grade fours over here. Uh, oh, sorry. Here was the, the grading system. In the histo histological grade, either astro oligo or os oligoastro were kind of mixed. So there's really quite heterogeneity. If you use it, look at the 2007 uh, classification system. When you start to look at alterations that uh, were incorporated in the 2016 WHO classification system, including IDH mutational status and 1.19Q codeletion, and P53 and ATRX, which I'm not showing, you really get um, uh, a better idea that the, these clusters here, these main clusters, are either split by IDH status and further split by 1P19Q co-deletion status. And so if you just kind of put these all together, you have what would be now known as the uh, oligodendron gliomas uh, IDH mutant 1P19Q that look down here, or the uh, IDH mutant um, astrocytomas uh, 1P19Q retained up here. And then here's your our IDH wild type diffuse gliomas. And uh, when we looked at uh, frequency um, of uh, copy number alterations within subregions of this um, defined kind of more in 2D and three-dimensional space, we did identify some uh, copy number alterations that seem to split survival curves and become prognostic. These are mostly um, based upon the gain of whole chromosome 1, the gain of whole chromosome 19, and the co-amplification of CDK4, MDM2. This, the algorithm here is not important, but we're able to at least split it up into a few different types, which, um, you know, this is not the only way to do um, uh, copy number of prognostic alterations, but it's kind of how we started and one of the ways we looked at. And when you do the um, survival plot in the TCGA, you really get a, a split of these tumors with um, this one we call W1 as the uh, poorest overall survival. And then we uh, collaborated with um, some folks in Switzerland and Germany to uh, get a second larger data set, uh, which uh, is called the German glioma network. And when we applied the same subtyping to these tumors uh, compared to the TCGA, and uh, uh, they have a, a similar survival. And here uh, we analyzed it a, a few different ways, but here I just want to show a linear regression showing um, how like a one-to-one -one, uh, the subtyping is for these. So the next thing we want to know is we had our defined copy number alterations. We think about this as it applies to clinical trials. So we know basically the, um, here I'm showing uh, the um, population or the distribution of uh, these specific copy number alterations in the TCGA data set and the German glioma network data set um, for all ages and ages of 65. And when we add in two prospective cohorts. One is the RT trial of elderly glioblastomas that was looking at bevacizumab, and then a paired initial recurrence trial where patients had to have had tumors um, that are deemed worthy of having a second operation. So more like a surgical trial that you can see that they're more enriched for the favorable prognostic copy number types. So there really is not only um, when, when you think about clinical trial, surgical trial, um, a selection bias for patients who look and do better to the clinician, there's also um, a selection bias towards a better copy number alteration profiling. And this can have uh, several implications uh, for copy number, uh, for clinical trials, including balancing of um, uh, trial arms, as well as um, looking at uh, subtype specific uh, therapy or starting people on trial that you know that won't make it past um, initial radiation. Uh, and I'll skip that point for the interest of time. And then um, and uh, one of the data sets, the paired surgical trial, we also had whole exome sequencing. And so we wondered um, if we take this and put it back onto the MDS map, 
of uh, the TCGA data, which I'm showing here. So gray is the TCGA, blue is the um, initial glioma, and red is the paired um, uh, recurrent tumor. How do they map uh, in comparison to IDH wild type blue blastomas? And um, it, it was pretty striking when we did this. We noticed that there was a, a region here where tumors seem not to um, arise from. So it indicated that these tumors themselves um, were so bad in such a way that um, they would never get a second surgical resection. Or, and, and we know from uh, some of our other mapping stuff we did, these tend to be genomically quiet and have a, a lower survival overall. So um, it, it was, we, we did um, go on to try and see if we can uh, understand. So this, these groups, which we'll call group one, group two, are defined genomically. Um, and they do have a survival difference. They have, um, it's indicated they have a different um, nat natural um, tumor course. Uh, but, and we went on to look at uh, clinical factors, um, age, uh, KPS, things like that. And then we looked at epigenetic factors, including methylation and RNA seq uh, data to see if we can explain differences beyond genomic data. And we couldn't. But what we, what we could, then we went on to ask, can we, um, do these people have, um, these two groups have different radiographic findings. They have different radiographic images that may be useful in detecting um, or predicting outcomes. And so I just wanted to uh, show this. Um, a lot of this work was spearheaded by Nick Nectarline, who's a graduate student in uh, computer science here at UW. And uh, our group's paper just came out on Monday. So just want to alert anybody that if they're interested in radio genomics to check this out, um, it's uh, open access and available. But um, basically what Nick did was we took the TCGA data, we knew the group one, group two, group one, the worst actors, group two is the better actors. There was the TCIA, the uh, cancer uh, imaging atlas of corresponding tumors. And so we had MRI data to look at these and looked at over 35,000 features of uh, different um, uh, modalities, uh, uh, looking at um, contrast enhancement, uh, T2 flare, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then took these um, these features and did a whole a lot of um, different transformations on them to come up with different equations or whatever, and train these um, features on um, on different components, and then they uh, did this loop random training set thing and came out with um, 288 features, and then we applied um, principal component analysis to reduce this further to uh, 15 features. When we do this, come up with a prediction model that's um, with a AUC of 80, uh, 80 so uh, not too bad in being able to distinguish the, um, the group two versus group one. And when we do this, um, it really seems to be driven by the transform data of edge detectors of uh, T2 flare uh, signaling, um, which is really hard to pick up by eye, but the, the computer was able to do this, showing that um, it's likely that these people with uh, more aggressive uh, copy number alteration profiles have more invasive tumor, and uh, perhaps that's why they're less amenable to resection. Um, again, if you want to read more about this, uh, that paper is now online. And the, the, the last topic I wanted to cover was um, that uh, there's been some interest within the neuro-oncology community here about look, trying to identify people who are poor acting versus better acting, at least on their copy number profiling. So um, we began collecting uh, glioblastoma tissues as a part of a Brooklyn Beatty uh, Institute initiative um, and now funded with the STTR grant, collecting tumor tissue from glioblastomas. Um, uh, tumor tissues mostly coming from Anup Patel and uh, neurosurgery here at UW. And these uh, tumors are undergoing uh, low pass whole genome sequencing uh, by uh, Tina Lockwood, who I can now say is in our department with, uh, with the merger. And then we're profiling these and um, applying them to the TCGA data set, reference mapping, and we want to apply class discrimination because mapping is not 
necessarily the best way to distinguish tumors, but come up with a way that we think that we can restratify patients beyond what is being done today. And this has, again, proposed patient impact. Um, you can balance clinical trial arms. You can query the low-pass whole genome sequencing signatures to see who might be responders to therapies. Again, if you have a clinical trial with only like a 10% uh, response rate, you know, it's a failed clinical trial, but who are those that respond? And I, I, I believe that we might be able to predict uh, responders simply based upon copy number alterations. And again, those who might uh, be predicted to do poorly or not survive radiation may get uh, upfront um, stratification in their own clinical trials. So uh, that's it for today's uh, talk on copy number alteration diffuse gliomas. Just a a, a recap, so we can leave some time for questioning. Um, diffuse astrocytic gliomas are classified by integrating histology and IDH mutational status. Um, updated grading in diffuse astrocytic glioma incorporates somatic copy number alterations. Again, for the grade two, grade three, if uh, histologically defined grade two, grade three, we can uh, incorporate EGFR amplification, gain of whole chromosome seven, loss of chromosome 10, trip promoter mutation, and for IDH mutant tumors, uh, incorporate CDKN2A homozygous deletion. And the uh, somatic copy number alterations uh, in this general category um, are prognostic in IDH wild type glioblastoma and have implications to inform um, clinical trial design. I uh, just wanted to thank everybody um, here who's been supportive and collaborated on this work. Again, uh, Dr. Keen and Becky Yoda for the um, the mitotic index project, Tina Lockwood, who is um, performing the low-pass whole genome sequencing, Eric um, Holland at the Fred Hutch, who's been my senior research mentor for these past five and a half years, uh, the other people in his group that have helped with the bioinformatics, uh, Anup Patel in surgery, who's uh, been a source of uh, some of the tumor tissue, as well as Chiba and Abdullah, who are uh, neuro neurosurgery residents who have helped with um, data uh, collection on patients and Nick Nectarline, who's uh, done a lot of pushing of this uh, radio genomics and machine learning, as well as um, Jim Fink and David Hainer, who are the neuroradiologists here who help uh, on that last project, as well as the um, German Glioma Network and all their help with uh, providing an invaluable data set. So with that, I will stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions or whatever. <laughs> Thank you, PJ. Thanks so much for really bringing all of us up to what I feel is the current state of these uh, of these rare tumors. So, um, just thinking about brain tumors in contrast to to um, many other solid tumors, um, where the natural history of the tumor um, often involves uh, extension into local structures, uh, the consequences of that metastases to uh, vital organs, the brain sometimes, uh, and so forth. Um, gliomas and astrocytomas are pretty much just localized to the cranial cavity. And what leads, what, what is the mechanistic cause of death? The different prognoses for the most part, is it mass location, response to therapy? I, I know you've touched on it in various ways and have these molecular correlates, but what is your feeling that really well, distinguishes the prognosis? Well, histologically, especially with glioblastomas and the diffuse gliomas that I'm talking about, they, um, they're quite diffusely infiltrative and they, can, they involve the, the CNS tumor even when you can't see them grossly by on, uh, operation or MRI. You have tumor cells throughout the brain. And so yeah. they're, they're just everywhere. And they also start to um, go down um, the, the brain stem and spinal cord. And you can also have leptomeningeal spread as well which for glioblastomas, the reported incidence is about 1%. Um, as far as mechanism of death, um, there's been some recent work on autopsy studies looking at patients with glioblastoma, uh, looking at historical autopsy series. Uh, one big one that came out of here with Buster Alvord and Dan Silvergeld showing where they had a lot more mass effect back before the STU protocol, back before chemotherapy and radiation. And now uh, the group out of Northwestern who has done something similar shows more brainstem involvement and less mass effect. So um, I, think, I think we're um, invading vital structures more yeah. um, and, and, and things like that. 
Yeah. Yeah, tough area. Um, let's see, any other questions out here? I don't see any questions in the chat line. And other than our about 40 attendees. I, I see Teresa just turn on her camera. Sorry, PJ, could I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. One of the things that I'm not clear that I, from the data, and I'm wondering if you might be able to shed some light on, is for the CDKN 2A um, deletions and IDH mutated tumors, do we think that that is biologically a distinct category, or do we think that that's a mutation that develops at the point that it becomes more aggressive? Um, uh, so I've seen data showing that recurrence typically have this more often, but there's still a group of about 15% or so that have this upfront de novo. So I think it's really a, a different classification, whether or not there's like other mutations associated with it uh, or not. But the, that, that's one of the ones where the data is pretty solid across multiple institutions looking at newly diagnosed IDH mastocytomas. That, that's, that's an independent prognostic marker across there. And what are the associations with it? We're not sure. Um, I don't know if Jerome's on this call. We had thought um, we had originally looked at the, the, the cases I profiled and done some MRI imaging. We thought there was a localization effect. Then we went on to look at this with Nick with the TCIA data and it turned out it was kind of the opposite. So the, 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 the localization effect didn't really um, validate. So we're not quite sure again how different these tumors are. But um, there could be work uh, done on there, seeing if uh, it, what biological pathways, anything if there's um, besides just cell cycle. I, I'm I'm not convinced that CDK and 2A is simply cell cycle, but there's other things going on with it that might be targetable within those. But um, I don't think um, that's really been studied that well. Just as a follow up, and for kind of practical purposes within the group, at uh, re-resection, will we plan to, if it was not deleted initially, to still test for it at re-resection? Are we going to rely more on histologic features for upgrading these? I don't know if there's data on that. Um, I think that's something as a community and a group we might have to think about. Um, I would think that in general, my, my guess that we probably would because of it, it we'd want to know similar like when we look at histology, if we want to know if something's progressed or if something that might make them uh, candidates or uh, for either TTF or other clinical trials or something, or where insurance might help cover some of the costs of um, treatments, it, you'd want to have that information. But uh, I'm sure like everybody else in our group, we're happy to discuss that. But I don't think there's any data right now to uh, say it confidently one way or another. Thank you so much. Oh, and I should have started with how wonderful this was. Thank you so much. Sorry for Thank you. PJ, I have, I have another question. Just thinking about other solid tumors, we think of uh, subclones arising in tumors and sometimes those can arise in the non-dominant masses some organs such as the prostate. Right. There's that sort of issue of heterogeneity and gliomas. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm not the best person to talk about this, um, um, but there are there, and this is known. Looking at what is thought to be like um, stem cell component of a glioblastoma or stem-like cell component, mm. a lot of um, this tumor uh, heterogeneity um, first described uh, originally with Anup Patel when he was at MGH looking at single cell uh, transcriptomics mm. uh, of this uh, type of tumor. And you can see evolving mutations and evolving clonality with um, tumor treated over time. Um, and there's a lot more focus on looking at uh, matched initial recurrence with, um, or matched um, profiling of initial tumors with uh, those that are recurrent and trying to do and trying to match those up. And you can see clonality and evolution and different mutations arise and uh, okay. shifting. Um, there's um, transcriptional subtypes. There's um, not quite a EMT type thing, but there's something similar where there's like a mesenchymal um, phenotype that seems to be more hmm. um, enriched in, uh, in tumors. And that's what, uh, in glioblastomas, and that's called the mesenchymal subtype. So you, some of some of that. 
So that's definitely a, that's definitely a concern, but not something that I've uh, touched on. And today. any evidence that uh, particular therapy may select for different uh, bone, different uh, types? So far, radiation is is yeah. what seems to be the big one, right? Finding you when you do a single cell sequencing of um, these kind of things, even with um, mouse models, you can see that there's a radiation resistant uh, subpopulation of cells that those are the ones that tend to grow back and repopulate the tumor. At least that's what's thought. But for specific tumors, I don't know. Okay. And just a final question, um, since no one else, I don't see any other questions, but a final one. Princeton Swanson, uh, which you, you referred to, I guess, some of her work with the uh, diffuse spreading of uh, gliomas um, before they become um, clinically uh, generalized. Does, is that still holding up that uh, gliomas are basically not, not resectable as masses, that they just so permeate the brain that it's, they can't be removed? Um, I would probably have to defer to my uh, surgical colleagues. Okay. Friends, but I know right. loca location matters, size matters, um, and then other clinical factors matter as well. So I think you can have more localized tumors, but if it's in a, um, somewhere like um, motor cortex or something like that, that's high real estate. Um, and, or even the spinal cord, right? They tend not to uh, take those out, rely more on chemotherapy and radiation. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions coming up. So PJ, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. And all of the update on information and the molecular phenotypes. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So signing off for now all, and um, Brooke will send out TME information. So thank you and bye now.